Soft lymphoid deformity is a complex disorder and basically it is due to the medially positioned soft tissue structures, ligaments are being stretched out along with the posterior tendon, which may not function very well. So deformity eventually leads to bony problems and then arthritis. So basically uh, it has been described with various stages and I'm going to kind of go more, more further into detail with those. So this is a classical exam you all see in your office uh, where the, there's a fixed a deformity and including, you can see this classical flat foot, classical supinated foot, as well as basically too many toe signs. Uh, typically when you see from the back, you'll see that there is inadequate indicative of the four foot abduction, where you'll see too many soles on one side, along with the heel being in valgus as compared to the right side. Also, you have to look for tenderness. So I'm, when I'm approaching these patients, I want to see where the pain is. Uh, sometimes the pain is medial. And then in later stages, the pain shifts laterally uh, over the sinus tarsi. So patient may tell you that the pain is not medially, but it's all lateral. And that's because the heel has gone into valgus and there is impingement of the peroneal tendon uh, between the distal fibula and the calcaneus. You can also have to do a single leg, a leg raise, as you know, because you have to check if the heel deformity is uh, rigid or is supple and if the patient can do it or if there's any pain. And that gives you an idea about whether the tendon is functioning or not. And accordingly, you can plan surgery. The other thing very important when you are approaching or fixing uh, flat foot deformity patients is the silver scule test. Uh, it's basically a test to check uh, whether the Achilles is contractured or just the gastro. And what you have to do is you have to supinate the foot to lock the midfoot. And then the only motion occurs at the ankle joint. And then you have to check how much ankle dorsiflexion they get with the knee extension and knee flexion. If the knee flexion uh, uh, dorsiflexion goes more, then most likely gastro having come from above the knee would be contractured and you most of the surgery in flat foot does involve gastroc release. I also do imaging and everybody's familiar with those, the standard views, ankle, uh, foot, as well as saltzman Kobe view. Uh, they are all weight bearing with the knee extended to get your correct angle before you plan surgery. And then you can see all these three criteria which everybody is familiar with, the lateral talo metatarsal angle or the Meary's angle. And we talk about negative Meary's angle where the uh, talus is plantar flexed. The calcaneal pitch angle being the uh, to see how much pitch angle there is or is there a flatness to the heel. And finally, the medial cuneiform to the floor distance to see if there's a midfoot collapse. There are other several angles described. One of them would be the talonavicular coverage angle. And it is important to uh, decide how much there is coverage before you can consider surgery, whether you want to do a lateral column lengthening or not. The more uh, the new things that uh, in imaging could be, and we don't have it in our institute, but weight bearing CTs, you will see that is being increasingly described along with the MRI scan, which is not as commonly done, uh, but weight bearing CT definitely is going to be in more use. And I have myself had experience where I thought patient did not have arthritis. I did treat the patient for flexible. And then I think eventually in two years, they did get arthritis. So I think weight bearing CT is going to be more and more used uh, uh, along with the MRI. So I've got uh, a few cases here. Uh, I think I just want to show you. So this is a 43-year-old female with two-year history of right medial hind foot pain. And uh, she was worse with increased activity, uh, atraumatic, so obviously no injury. Always with a history of flat foot uh, since she was a kid and she works in retail as well as she has had no treatment in the past. So when I looked at her, she had standing alignment. She had bilateral hind foot valgus, more pronounced on the right and the collapse of the midfoot. So she did have collapse. She had a bilateral heel valgus more on the right side. She was tender on the posterior tibial tendon at the level of medial malleolus. Uh, she was passively correctable. And when corrected, the flexible forefoot. There was, so again, this flexible forefoot supination is important to see whether you need to do any cotton sarcotomy or not. So she was unable to do single leg raise, obviously due to pain. And she was weak on plantar flexion inversion with a positive silver skewer test. So these were her x-rays and you can see that she is right now has a Mary's angle, which is negative. She has got a flexible foot, uh, but basically she is tender with the posterior tendon. These are her x-rays of the ankle and you can see the heel valgus uh, obviously going more on one side than the other. So I think what I look for when these cases would be, where is the tenderness? So the tenderness is the posterior tendon uh, at the level of the medial malleolus with weakness. So how would you address that? So standing alignment, x-rays were done, collapse of the midfoot is there, she is flexible. And then so 
For that reason, I would definitely do an FDL tendon transfer. So the, the way I approach it would be that if there is tenderness of the posterior tendon, obviously you have to expose the tendon, debride it, and most likely this uh, lady will get an FDL tendon transfer. If she has got a, a hind foot valgus, which is more pronounced on the right side, then we have to address the hind foot valgus. And most commonly done osteotomy will be the medial sliding osteotomy of the calcaneus. Uh, sometimes you have to uh, see how much slide she has to, typically up to a centimeter is what she would need to correct her hind foot valgus. So I think, uh, so hind foot valgus will be addressed uh, by doing the calcaneus slide. Now, last thing would be the silver skewer test. How would you do, how would you deal with that? And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the gastroc release is what you would be doing if uh, the, the ankle dorsiflexion is improved when the knee is flexed. So depending on the silver skewer test, she will also need a gastroc recession. So I think basically what we are looking here is where are the deformities located? Are they flexible? And then according to where the symptoms are, we address individual problems. And you can see that uh, the, the calcium osteotomy was done and uh, she did uh, pretty well after the surgery. I'm sorry. So she also had an FDL tendon transfer to the calcium, uh, to the navicular. Now in case two, I think uh, what I want to show was basically everything was the same except that when you correct the hind foot, uh, yeah, when you do the medial displacement calculus osteotomy, tendon transfer, gastroc release, the forefoot is still in supination. So how, how do you uh, basically deal with that? So in that case, you either have to do a lapidus fusion or a, a opening wedge medial, uh, medial cuneiform osteotomy to bring the first metatarsal down. So I think once you correct your uh, other deformities, what you need to check would be the supination part of the foot. You can clearly see here that it needs to be corrected. And in that case, either uh, in this particular case, I did a lapidus fusion at the, as well as the FDL tendon transfer. The other case I had was a 14-year-old young lady. She had knee pain. Uh, it resolved with orthotics. Uh, basically, the orthotic did help her during uh, kind of day-to-day -day activities. She used to play soccer and had knee pain. But more importantly, she had uh, bilateral hind foot valgus as well as forefoot abduction. So basically, she had too many toe signs. Uh, she was able to do single heel raise without pain and the hind foot fully corrected. So I think she probably does not need any osteotomy. So no pain over the posterior tendon. So basically, she had no pain. So the tendon was functioning and the silver scale test was positive. So she is again a young lady. Uh, these were her x-rays. And basically, how do you, and she still, she's almost about to stop growing. So how do you deal with these patients? So bilateral hind foot valgus and forefoot abduction with too many toe signs, able to do single leg raise. So the posterior tendon was intact, hind foot fully corrects, no pain, and then silver skewer test. So basically, for these patients, I typically will do a lateral column lengthening procedure. And that's because the hind foot is in valgus. And to correct that, I think lateral column lengthening would be more ideal to bring the foot more into anatomical position. Because she was able to do single leg raise without pain, so again, I think the message is if there's no pain of the posterior tendon, you don't have to necessarily address that. Uh, so there's no need for a uh, FDL tendon transfer. And the silver skewer test, uh, I think I addressed that with a gastroc recession. So basically, if you have a tight gastroc, then the gastroglycine needs to be done. And here in this case, uh, we did a lateral column lengthening to bring her arch back and make the calcaneal pitch angle normal. Uh, and so basically that was what was done. Case four history. Uh, this is a 55 year old female with progressively worsening flat foot deformity and left foot pain with no issue of trauma and pain over the lateral foot. She's a retired lady. She's obese. She has bilateral hind foot valgus worse on the left. She's unable to do single heel raise uh, due to balance and tenderness over the sinus tarsi in the subfibular region and no pain of the posterior tendon with a rigid hind foot. So as soon as you hear uh, the word rigid, I think uh, the algorithm here is basically, you can see here, uh, the foot is uh, pretty much stiff and it's not really much mobile. So I think the answer to this uh, would be a triple arthrosis. Uh, in this particular case, I use uh, screws across uh, the subtalar joint Taylor navicular joint, as well as the calcaneal cuboid joint, and that basically helped her problem. 
So this is case five history. Uh, basically, fifty year old female with left medial foot pain for two months. She works in retail and worsening pain after being on her feet. Never with any having any similar episode before. She had bilateral hand foot valgus worse on the left. She was able to do. She had some pain with the single heel raise, uh, and she had pain on resisted plantar flexion inversion and pain over insertion of the posterior tendon. She had a flexible hind foot and the silver skewer test was positive. Here are her x-rays and here are the x-rays again of the AP and oblique view. And then uh, this is a lateral view. So basically uh, in that particular case, I do not have the x-ray, but I think we ended up doing basically a flat foot reconstruction procedure uh, where we did uh, FDL tendon transfer and then uh, addressed her uh, heel valgus with calculus or shortcoming. The next patient is a left medial foot pain. She's 66 year old, uh, basically uh, male, sorry, with acute onset uh, pain over the medial foot uh, after motor vehicle accident. Uh, there was pain and swelling immediately after the injury. Uh, basically, she, he started noticing progressive collapse of his foot and he failed orthotics and Arizona brace. So 66 year old with an acute onset medial left foot pain after motor vehicle accident. So physical examination showed a hind foot valgus on the left, uh, collapse of the arch, tenderness in subfibular region, uh, tenderness under the plantar T and joint. So that is kind of the pointer here that there was tenderness here with a supple hind foot. And she, he did have some power in the posterior tendon and was able to do single heel raise. So I think this is a scenario where there's a spring ligament tear where patient had acute onset pain, uh, very quickly developed flat foot deformity with a heel valgus and uh, they were tender uh, basically under the plantar T and joint. So these are the x-rays and really nothing really showed much apart from that. So the plan for this patient was a spring ligament repair and reconstruction, medial calcaneal slide, gastroc recession and uh, cotton osteotum. So this is just a slide to show the spring uh, ligament repair, how we do uh, once we expose uh, medially. I do remember the spring ligament runs from the sustentaculum tali to the navicular bone and it is like a hammock. Uh, it supports the talus and stops it from going into plantar flexion. So initially, uh, I put in the anchor in the uh, the bicular, uh, bone, and then basically, if you find the other end of the uh, spring uh, ligament, okay. sorry, yeah. So if, once you find the other end of the spring ligament, you can repair it directly. But a lot of the time, I use a tendon allograph basically because it helps me give more security. I've also started using an internal brace uh, recently, which is also like a fiber wire suture. Here I am putting my drill hole into the sustentaculum, which is the footprint of the uh, origin of the spring ligament, and then basically repair the ligament uh, with the, the anchor on one side and the uh, other side in the sustentaculum tail. So you can see that. And then finally, once you do that, if you have to still have to do the FDL tendon transfer, you can still do it. This is the cotton osteotomy done for the patient. And this is the final result. Uh, let me just uh, go through quickly another set of screens. So sorry about this. So, I think that's what I have today. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, are you finished with them? Uh, I, I'm just going to check if I am missing any slides here. Uh, just mm -hmm. let me give me two seconds. Yeah, I think I went through the cases, obviously. And uh, yes, I think pretty much done. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sate, for this wonderful talk. And uh, I think uh, you have really highlighted whether we need to understand actually where the deformity is, what is the actual problem, and uh, the problem need to be solved according to that, whether there's hind foot valgus, mid foot uh, abduction, and uh, tight TA, residual supination, whether there's impingement or not. And uh, now I think uh, we can take the questions later on 
and I would like to invite our uh, Indian faculty, uh, Dr. S. M. Ajoy, to give the Indian perspective of the flat foot reconstruction. And uh, it is my pleasure to introduce him. He is a senior consultant in foot and ankle services at Ramaya Medical College, Bangalore. He is a fellowship trained surgeon in foot and ankle surgery from National University Hospital, Singapore, Switzerland. And he is an associate editor of uh, Journal of Foot and Ankle Surgery, Asia Pacific, and is also a former secretary of Indian Foot and Ankle Society. Apart from that, he has uh, interest in uh, tissue banking, and he has done his diploma from Barcelona, and he is coordinator of the Ramaya Tissue Bank. He has been faculty to many AO and allied courses and has many publications to his credit. May I invite Dr. S.M. Ajoy to give the Indian perspective, and then we can take the questions later on. And I request the audience to put the questions into the chat box so that we can take these questions with the respective speakers. Uh, Dr. Joy, please, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I feel quite honored being here amongst uh, teachers and mentors uh, who have uh, actually helped me pick up my uh, threads about foot and ankle surgery itself. Now, at the outset, can I just play a short video? This is from the... Oh. Uh-huh. It's video on? Uh, this is a video. This is the welcome video, which has come from uh, Dr. Rajesh Simon. Is this visible? No. Sure. I think we are so we all are just going to do I yes, got fun coach. Yeah. Uh, it's not starting yet. Uh, just sir, otherwise you can share the video in WhatsApp. I'll uh, share the video from my end. No worries. Okay, right. Please go ahead with the talk and then we can, even in the end, we can uh, play the video after the talk, if you want. Okay, fine. That should be okay. Yeah, is this visible? Slides and... No, no. No, slides is not visible. Your screen is not visible. Please. It's still not visible, Dr. Joy. Yeah, I'm trying to do that. And you also, can you start screen sharing? Just click on share and then say screen. Is it visible yeah. now? Yes, okay. it's coming. Yeah, it's come. Let's go to the first slide, sir. Go full screen, first slide. Yes, okay. I'm perfect. Thank you. Right. Okay, uh, so uh, thank you very much, everyone, and uh, let's uh, move on. I think uh, Dr. Sate has shown us a very wonderful presentation with regard to the flat foot itself, and uh, how do we manage these patients? Now, uh, when we are looking at patients, we might see some of them who are in th this state, some of them uh, with a collapsed arch. This is a 32-year-old lady whom I'm just showing, and uh, that's the arch collapse which was there and could be identified very well to be coming from the midfoot uh, from the uh, hind foot itself and that of a younger adult 26 year old boy uh, who was having a uh, rigid flat foot so would we be able to treat both of them the same way that's not going to be the same isn't it so we are going to always try and aim to see that we get a proper correction of these patients and this is something which is very desirable for us but uh, would we be able to achieve this in each and every patient? So that's what we're going to look at over here. This is the brief overview. Let us look at how, in the Indian perspective, how common it is to have flat foot. Are all of these patients who are there having flat foot symptomatic? How do we image them? We don't have weight-bearing CT. How are we going to image these patients? What do we have an algorithm for treatment? And uh, based on the literature that's available, and a short surgical video as to one of the procedures for pest planus which I do perform. So we actually looked at the incidence of uh, flat foot here in India. So among the 14 to 16 year age groups, 
what we noticed was that almost 33% of these children were having a pesplanus. Fortunately, 90% of them were flexible and 10% of them, 10 of them were rigid. But then it does amount to a very significant number of patients if they actually come with complaints. We always start the, examining these patients with the same way. Then we first look at the footwear. When we look at them, we know that the footwear is worn out on this side, indicative that this patient is walking more on the medial aspect of the foot itself. We look at these patients, uh, inspect them completely, look for the two minute toes, look for the hind foot valgus, and then also we check to see if these patients are flexible or rigid. One of the ways of checking this is to perform a JAGS test, wherein you can see that by just gently dorsiflexing the great toe, we are able to recreate the arch in this way, in these. Well, not everybody would be able to perform a single heel raise, so we might go with the double heel raise test initially, and then on try to identify if this uh, uh, whole flexible flat foot is a reducible one. So if you uh, give gentle pressure onto the talar head and see, you might be able to reduce this patient and recreate an arch without actually allowing for a uh, weight bearing in this patient. So this is something which we can always assess even on the table to see if this uh, flat foot is flexible and if there's a tight tendoculus or a gastroc associated with it. Are we having connection problem? So, uh, uh, are you not seeing? Uh, is everybody able to? Sir, see? everything no. is clear. Everything is clear, sir. It is fine. Yeah, yeah. Please okay, go okay. Ahead. Fine. Sorry. Okay. Right. And uh, this is a uh, like a clock analogy to see what would happen in case the tendoculus is tight and it is short. So we would end up with something uh, wherein. Uh, the like the hands of the clock, you can see that the talus and the calcaneum are pulling at uh, logarithms to each other, and that is what we can see in these patients when you examine the hand foot itself. Standard imaging is required as we go ahead. We can see that the AP standing and the AP lateral uh, and the standing lateral images are there, indicative whether this patient is having a collapse of the uh, arch and uh, whether the Mary's angles are maintained and where the pitch is. Salzman views, of course, can be very informative, and uh, these patients, we always get to do a, a, a scanogram to see if there is any issues higher up, if the patient is developing any deformities proximally also. Indicators for a, uh, getting an MRI done is tenderness on the medial side to see if the spring ligament is intact, which is being shown on the slide on the left and to see what's the status of the accessory navicular. Very often patients do complain of pain at that region to see if there is any reaction there and that is one of the sources of pain on the medial side without causing any tear in the tibialis, tend uh, tibialis posterior tendon. And this also, of course, can be imaged by getting an MRI and you can see a torn tibialis posterior which is retracted over there. Now, in the Indian scenario where we don't have access to a weight-bearing CT, it is very easy for us to repurpose what the fluoroscopy machine. So this fluoroscopy machine is used in the radiology department for imaging, for barium studies, and for all other motility studies, and also for IVUs. So what, what we can do is tilt this table and get the patient to stand there, standing on one leg, and ask them to see if they can correct themselves or they cannot correct themselves. So most often, these patients have got some amount of a flexibility and that can very well be established by tracing these patients uh, tell us to see how well it is moving this is a continuous video of this which i have not been able to insert which is the reason i'm showing this now this was introduced to us uh, dr sati introduced this topic of uh, having uh, uh, the different nomenclatures available uh, now which is the most common nomenclature is that of a progressive collapse in foot deformity and the classification which went along with that and very often you see that if there is somebody who is flexible, who has got a peritoral subluxation or dislocation and is not having any subfibular impingement, I think those are patients which we can pick and perform simple in, uh, minimally invasive procedures wherein we are able to address them. A review that was in 2024, very recently and in the month of February, we had an article coming up wherein all the classification systems for acquired uh, flat foot have been reviewed and these patients and they have come out with a three uh, column uh, three c classification wherein we are able to classify these patients but then all of this classification if you can see 
is the in conclusion after performing the review what they have mentioned is that it allows the feet to be typed deformity to be zoned and ligament laxity to be, to be uh, laxity to be staged but then this is not in any way going to aid us in designing and determining what kind of a surgery this patient would be requiring. So what would, should the approach to the management involve? It should be involved to check if this flat foot is flexible or not, if there is a site where the site of the collapse is happening, if the medial structures are intact or not, which has been clinically uh, uh, achieved by checking for tenderness and checking for the uh, reduction of the Tyler heads, then we are looking to see if there's any lateral impingement that would also determine what kind of procedures we perform. If there's a midfoot abduction and it can be corrected passively, that also can be checked. If there's a forefoot which is either in a valgus or a varus, all that can also be assessed. And the presence of, of arthritis, which would entail us to go ahead with planning for fusion procedures. But what I do feel is whether the severity of the pest planus and the age of the patient, do these help us in any way to determine what kind of surgery we perform. Is it possible for us to extend indications towards the older age group? That is what I've actually been debating. And we are also performing a study comparing two different procedures where one against visa is the other. An adult patient, she's around 60, but she's having a pest planus who is now very symptomatic. She's got pain predominantly on the medial aspect. But then uh, if you can see, that's how she stands. That's her... Uh, 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 hand foot which is going to valgus but there aren't too many toes which are visible for her and she was flexible this is the same patient I'm just showing she was flexible and when we took her these are her x-rays you can see a collapsed uh, Mary's arch and a calcaneal pitch which is reduced and uh, which is there on both sides and on the left side is where she was very symptomatic with the excessive talonavicular uncoverage and the same being carried on with the salzmanus also Intraoperatively, when we did examine her, I was able to reduce this very well, and uh, I was found that she had a tight uh, tendoculus in her case. So that's the procedure being performed over here. So I do mark out that the, we check the two bony prominences, which is one is the lateral malleolus, and the second is the anterior process of the calcaneus, which we are seeing. And the incision is placed. There are the two nerves which are marked out: the sural and the septal. The, the superficial peroneal and midway between the, all of that is where the incision is being placed. This leads us directly into the sinus tarsi. So that's the uh, plan. And uh, for the tendoculus, uh, we can do a partial uh, triple hemisections, mark out the tendoculus and mark out the areas where we're going to go with the triple hemisection for this uh, tendoculus itself. There are two valgus, because it's in valgus, two towards the lateral side and one towards the medial side is what we pref prefer. And sometimes I may even go with the uh, fourth incision if required. So just uh, from the midline towards the lateral is how we are going to uh, perform the partial uh, hemisection of the tendoculus itself. And at each and every stage, we're going to stretch it out to see if at the end of the uh, three cuts that we have made, we are able to get a, a dorsiflexion which is adequate enough for us to sustain. So this is what was checked. And once we had performed, we could see that there was a adequate amount of dorsiflexion which was possible in this particular patient. That's the incision being performed exactly into the sinus tar side. You can see that it's only the skin that we're going to cut. We don't have to cut deeper at all. So once the skin is cut, we utilize uh, an artiforceps which we can, which, which we are able to dis uh, dissect out the soft tissues gradually so that we are not going to damage anything for that matter. And once we have done that, the you can see that the sinus tarsi which is going in and it's being demonstrated here is not directed anteriorly, it is directed posteriorly. So that's the way we will have to direct. So if we are going in that way, we always have to direct towards the posterior aspect. So reach out there, reduce the talus and that's the position in which we will be going with the intended tenotomy scissors. That's the tenotomy scissors which is being shown here and uh, through which you can go direct this posteriorly again and a short snip there of the interosseous talocalcaneal ligament will release and allow us to move the talus very well. A guide wire placed there to check that we are exactly in the sinus tarsi will lead us to show where we are. 
and imaging and the IITV will also show us. So you can see here that we are completely able to uh, realign the talus and the calcaneus under the, the tibia. And uh, this is uh, possible in different sizes to hold up the sinus tarsi can be checked out. So that's the sizes which are being used. So we start off with a size of 5 mm in width and then on uh, assess to see if that is adequately reducing the uh, and filling up the uh, sinus tarsi itself. And the, we achieve the right amount of uh, correction. And where to do this, we see that these uh, spacer that we're going to use, or the stand that we're going to use, is going to lie exactly at the lateral border of the neck of the talus. And when that is being done, to see if we still have a good amount of eversion uh, present for us, and if we have a good amount of a dorsiflexion which is there for us. So this is what we assess. And once that is done, we use, so that is quite satisfactory. We do have some amount of an eversion. What we have done is we have only prevented the excessive eversion of these patients and have reduced the talus onto the calcaneus quite normally. That's the stent which is going into place, inserted over the uh, guide wire. And once that has been done, you can just go ahead, uh, perform this same reduction manuals uh, just to see, put the whole thing through a range of movement, and then we're going to uh, remove the insert introducer and ch check out. So you can see that the arch which was not there has already been formed right on the table itself. And you can see that a good amount of a dorsiflexion is possible without the foot going into an eversion, everted position. The sinus starts a stent in position, and that's the closure which is done. So it's a very minimal invasive procedure, not indicated for everyone, but only for those where we can we are able to relocate the talus onto it. That's the uh, snips that we had made into the tendoculus, which should heal up without having to do any suturing itself. And that's the correction which is achieved on the table. So I've not summed up anything, so I, because I wanted to lead this directly into a discussion which is the reason I don't have a summary over here. Well, the thank, you, Dr. Jai for the, thank you, Dr. Jai, for this uh, wonderful talk. And uh, I think we have uh, ample time for discussion now, 20 minutes. So uh, let, let me take the questions first, which are first directed. There are only two questions which are directed to Dr. Vinaya. One is the earliest age of surgery in the flat foot. Uh, do you have any parameters to judge at what age the surgery should should be there? So, good question. Okay, I think uh, I've never done anything. I don't see patient actually below 12 or 14 in my clinic. We have a separate children's hospital in uh, Connecticut. But I think uh, uh, the way I deal with it is if there's a progressive deformity, let's say, and here we have uh, American kids playing football, they are 12, 13, 14, and they are six foot four and 250 pounds sometimes. So I think uh, what I look for is the symptoms and also the progressive deformity. Sometimes the parents will come at the age of 14, he plays football, his foot is collapsing under his foot. And uh, obviously uh, they are worried that this Achilles tendon is getting tighter. So my answer to that question is a little bit in a circumvent way that uh, I don't see anybody below 12 or 14 to be giving you an answer for a pediatric flat foot uh, thing. But certainly for adolescent and pubertal, I think around 12 or 14, uh, that's my indication of the arthrorhizis crew. So I try, to use, I, I try to make them go adulthood till they are 17, 18. And then that's where my indication for arthritis crew is, along with Achilles release or gastroc release. And then I take take it out at the age of 17, 18, and then treat them like a regular uh, adult flat foot uh, case. So that's uh, that's what I I usually do. Dr. Manak, there was a second question, the role of arthritis, which is you've already answered uh, in this. Now coming to the age, uh, I would like to take it further that uh, does the age influences your decision? Like if you're getting something like 60-year-old or 65-year-old, then you joint preserving versus joint sacrificing surgery. What is uh, how you make your choice whether uh, this is going to be or it is just like uh, any anywhere, same for 40 years and uh, 65 years, 75 years? So again, good question. I think... Uh, 
typically, as you know, flat foot deformity is in middle-aged women and, you know, a little bit of obesity, above 50, 6, 55, 60 is a normal age. And I, of course, take every case individually. So depending upon, as we discussed, rigid or flexible uh, deformity, I usually address uh, what is their problem? Is that a pain, their problem? Is it the heel valgus? Uh, basically, is the deformity getting worse? And what are their activities they like to do? So essentially, I, it, I like to do joint preserving procedures in a flexible case. Uh, but I have got burnt, as I mentioned uh, in my talk, that I think uh, with the weight-bearing CT, uh, I've seen that some of these patients did come back in two, I think one came back around two and one came back after five years saying that, no, it didn't work. And so, and then when I went back, uh, I think uh, the CT uh, was non-weight-bearing, obviously, but I think the weight-bearing CT apparently does show more and more of these patients sometimes have arthritis, subcontral sclerosis, and they are actually one stage beyond what you think. So even though uh, th there is a flexibility uh, and obviously it depends on the patient's uh, weight and age, I also tell them that I may not be able to give you a foot uh, for the next 20 years and that this may still progress. And eventually you may need a triple or a double arthrodesis. So uh, again, I think weight-bearing CT is going to give us more information along with MRI, uh, but my go-to is joint saving procedures initially. Uh, and then basically joint fusion if needed to be. So just continuing with this uh, joint sacrificing versus uh, joint preserving, uh, one of the procedures that is subtalar arthrodesis, uh, how you actually, both of this is to both of the speakers, uh, you know, the patient is having a lateral uh, pain and but is having a even a flexible uh, flat foot and uh, the subtalar is okay, not... Uh, so how to actually make this decision, whether in the presence of impingements, you go ahead with the, some uh, uh, calcaneal slide or a subtalar. It is to both the, both the speakers in a flexible uh, flat foot, how you make the choices between the osteotomy and the subtalar arthrodesis. Uh, uh, this is for both the speakers. Dr. Ajay, I want to go. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, yeah, when, uh, <laughs> see if it is flexible and uh, the joint per se is not very tender, which can generally happen. In those instances, uh, what I do is I go with something like a joint preservation itself. It's not con it's not possible to convince these patients for a, a fusion on this uh, patients at all. So, I still try to preserve even if the patient is around 60 and this no involvement of the joint, which is often common. And because I learned this the hard way, because I had actually posted a patient for uh, fusion. Actually, I wanted to do a subtalar fusion, opened her up on the medial side, because I knew that if I were going to go on the lateral side, I might not end up with a good closure. Opened on the medial side, and when I, op I found the subtalar joint to be very, very pristine, this excellent cartilage there, and I just didn't feel like fusing this. Then I went ahead with uh, something like a joint preservation only in that case again. So I think, uh, yeah. So, so I think there are some outliers, as was mentioned earlier, that you know, as, you, as Dr. Ajay was nicely described as well, that sometimes at the age of sixty, uh, I also take into consideration their weight, uh, their activity level. And uh, some, uh, and as I said, if if patient is obese and there are papers for and against it, but I've had patient where there was a pretty high BMI and pretty obese patient, and if you look at uh, the FDL tendon, uh, it's really like one third the size of posterior tendon. I mean, when you see that FDL, do you really think in your mind it's going to work for the next ten years? That's my question mm -hmm. to myself. So in those patients, so my kind of go-to, I also do subtalar joint injection sometimes to see if they have any pain relief from there or they have any arthritis or any other symptom. But uh, there are outliers where I would fuse, especially obese patients who are really, uh, they, they're not going to do well with uh, whatever you do. Uh, and I do uh, kind of offer them a triple arthrodesis or subtalar. Uh, but uh, again, I, I try to do joint saving, but I think certain outliers I do, uh, fusion as well. Okay, uh, you know, in in the practice, you may get a flexible sort of a, a flat foot where you see you get an MRI done, you see some impingement signs. There is edema over the cutaneous and 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 the lateral process impinging into it, and the patient has a lateral pain. So, but the still it's a flexible. Uh, how you actually? I I wanted that you make your decision that. Is this patient to go for subtalar arthrodesis or to go for 
I think if it's just edema but, and uh, nothing beyond that, uh, I would certainly do a subtalar injection uh, to see uh, how much pain relief they got, just to get an idea of whether it is helping them or not. Uh, I would those patients. I would definitely do a medial slide just to reduce the pressure. Or as you know, it's a peritalar subluxation. So I would definitely do a slide. Or sometimes I've also done, although not that commonly, both a slide and the lengthening at the same time. Although I'm not very good at it, sometimes you can get it. So, but I think it's like a double osteotomy, is so that you reduce the peroneal tendon impingement, but at the same time the talus is located under. Uh, basically, the talus is located over the calcaneus in a good position. So I think double slide which is where the Evans and the lengthening is what I would do. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of in the second case, you showed that you went ahead with the fusion of the first TMT joint yes. and uh, I was the residual supination. What was the actually reason that you decided between the cotton and, and the, you know, the first TMT fusion? What was the reason that you went ahead with the TMT fusion? So if I remember correctly, and I've done a few of the, I think if I remember correctly, I typically will do uh, even pre-op, but also on the table, the instability test, the tarsometatarsal instability test. And if they are too lax, uh, then I usually would do a fusion. So if I remember correctly, and I do it in every of my patient that I will check that joint uh, to see if it is, and then if it's unstable or very lax, then I prefer a TMT fusion. Sometimes I've even done a whole medial column fusion if they're really unstable. So probably that was what I wanted to highlight. So the, the supination can be corrected. Well, mm -hmm. there's another very common problem that there's the association of the hallux valgus with the uh, flat foot. Does it influences the your, your algorithm for the surgery? And uh, what is the how you go ahead first, second, at the same time? Questions to both uh, of the speakers, the Indian as well as their perspective. Doctor, if you want to go, I can talk after. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm sorry. <laughs> Lot of questions from my side because I don't have anything in the chat box. <laughs> okay. Okay. So uh, yeah. So if there's an associated hallux valgus and uh, this uh, with the pes planus, I think Plata. we first add. Yeah, we first address the uh, the uh, collapsing foot itself. Try to uh, attain uh, the right uh, position with regard to the hind foot alignment itself. So we image it, uh, we check it clinically on the table, image it, and make sure that we have got the whole thing uh, correct. Means we got the hind foot correct. Then try to align the hallux. Means try to al align the uh, valgus to the same thing. Now, if there is an associated uh, MTP arthritis with it, I think sometimes a fusion would make sense at the MTP joint, but then in case it's a very flexible kind of a hallux valgus, I think we can plan for an osteotomy. I'm more uh, familiar with a triple kind of an osteotomy where even if there's an uh, associated uh, metatarsus, which is slightly in adductus kind of a thing, then we can do a proximal osteotomy and a distal soft tissue release and realign them. So I think that is what I would uh, probably be doing. And uh, at the same time, I also just wanted to check in case we want to do a TMT fusion, because I wanted to ask this question to Dr. Vinay. When we are doing a, a TMT fusion uh, with regard with the with the hallux valgus correction, so how do we so do we de determine the position on table itself? Because the, do you replicate a weight bearing to see where that foot is going to stay? Because I have ended up actually fusing one of the patients and it wasn't very appropriate. So at the end, I found that the foot is not actually completely touching the floor. So just wanted to know your tips and tricks for that as well. So a, a good question. I think if you are, if uh, we are addressing here a flat foot construction which has been done and now patient has hallux valgus and as you said, we are doing lapidus or first EMT fusion. So uh, what I typically do, of course, uh, apart from uh, preparing the joint, I put in two uh, pins or guide wires, one in the metatarsal, one in the uh, first cuneiform. And basically, as you all know, I mean, usually you have to rotate the metatarsal as well as do like a lateral close wedge uh, to correct that metatarsus adductus. So what I do is I put, put uh, one pin in the first metatarsal, more plantar flex, because I know I have to basically get the, the, the first metatarsal rotated back to its neutral alignment and then try to start at almost 90 degrees and get them together and then temporarily hold it and I put a foot plate underneath to see whether both are in good alignment. So I think one pin and then the other pin is almost 90 degrees 
to it in the metatarsal and rotate it. And then you basically hold the position to see. Uh, that's my kind of trick, if you will. And then you you have all sorts of new devices here to, uh, you know, uh, get a clamp around it and then bone graft if needed. And then uh, you go ahead with your fusion with uh, plates and two cross screws. Mm -hmm. My one question was whether you stage the procedures or you do at the same time the Halex valgus connection and uh, uh, foot reconstruction. So, uh, you know, some patients... Uh, Depends. Some patients will say that it doesn't bother me. And I've had both patients actually, where they had a flat foot deformity. And it's almost tempting as a foot and ankle surgeon to say that, you know, do you, and, uh, and I'm sure you have in your clinic too. Uh, and so I don't, I initially I used to think about it, but I don't try to fall in that trap. So I will ask my patient, do you want to get it done at the same time? And it is bothering you. So I think, uh, if some of them will, uh, so again, I think it's patient driven to a certain extent. Some will say, you know, uh, you you decide what you you think, and that can be a hard call. But I think coming back to the answer, I do offer them if it is significant, like moderate to severe valgus, and I will tell them it it may get worse and continue to get worse. So I think that's our deal. I give the patient a choice, and more often than not, they will probably if it's a moderate to severe, they'll say, yeah, just get it done at the same time. Uh, there's another new thing which is cropping up with time that is minimal invasive surgery. And uh, I would just like to uh, know what procedures in Flatfoot which you think can be done through these uh, uh, minimal invasive techniques. Because even a Joy is doing hydrogen you guys must be doing. Uh, so if both of you can throw some highlight of, uh, on, on the procedures, you can look after, uh, you know, for a bit minimal invasive surgery. So I think minimal music calcaneal osteotomy is now pretty much widespread. Everybody, I think a lot of people do it. I personally do it too. And uh, I think that's like a, mo, mo, one of the most uh, common procedure now in regards to the flat foot that you can do uh, with a burr, uh, like a Shannon burr. And you do basically a calcaneal osteotomy and then put a screw. So I think uh, that's the most common application for MI surgery uh, for the calcaneal osteotomy. I do not have personal experience of joint fusion, although I'm trying now to do some midfoot fusion. For example, if you're doing any fusions or lapidus to do with the burrs, uh, I don't have much experience with that, but I do have at my disposal uh, and I plan to do that in the future. But uh, calcaneus, I've done it. Yeah, I think it, it looks really, it works out very well. The sural nerve, once you protect it and the wound healing is great. And I think, I think it's a quick procedure as well. So uh, that's what I will apply for now. I have totally switched on to MIH intercranial osteotomy uh, personally. Uh, uh, how, uh, what about uh, you, Dr. Uh, Ajoy? Yeah, I think those would be the same indications. I think do we cannot extend it any beyond that. And uh, I think that's where we could utilize it. And of course, the uh, going with the extra uh, civilization, that of course we could call it as a minimal invasive procedure too. Uh, so, uh, we have just four minutes and uh, something about the latest developments like PCFD classification, weight bearing, CT scan. Uh, do you think that uh, uh, these are uh, going to uh, add to our knowledge and our thinking uh, what is going to happen in the future? Are we going to base our decisions on uh, this weight bearing CTs and uh, all, uh, all these uh, things like new algorithm, like PC, PCFD and all that. Is it going to influence our decision making? Um, so Dr. I Jai. think, yeah, can, Dr. Ajay, do you want to answer? I can follow you, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, both of you, uh, you know, these are something new things which are happening. Uh, and I just wanted the opinion of both the speakers on this. Okay, so and I you can go ahead. Yeah, okay, so, oh, sorry. Oh, no problem. So I think, uh, so two separate issues. One is the classification. And I just remember reading a, piece, a paper recently. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Ajay also published, or rather read another third paper about another classification coming through. So the PCFD is uh, becoming mainstream, number one. Uh, I think there was a paper about inter and intra-observer reliability of this classification. The, I'm talking about the PCFD. And they, they, they were not sure about it. I think they found that that there was probably in intra-observer reliability. So the same doctor could get uh, the patient in the same classification, but inter-observer was not as 
it was still kind of not quite there yet. So I think uh, it's not, I don't think it's mainstream, but I think in regards to the reliability issue, I think probably more papers will come to see whether it is worthwhile because somebody might say, no, this is flexible. Somebody might say this is not peritaleal subluxation. So I think it's hard to say. Uh, and uh, I, the, it makes sense though, the classification, because it describes so many deformities and we know one part of the foot is different than the other where one is rigid. And coming to your CT, yes, I think weight-bearing CT is definitely going to be mainstream. It is all over the place. Every foot and ankle society meeting, there are weight-bearing CTs for bunion surgeries, for flat foot. And I think it's going to be mainstream, definitely. Yeah. And even there are classifications, weight-bearing CT classifications coming up. Thank you. Last question from the chat box. And this is last. What do you do for the flexible flat foot with the hyperlax increased bite and scores? What is the take on that in a young, uh, this is from the uh, chat box, uh, let's say a 10 or 12 year or something, make hyperlax person with a flexible, uh, how you approach that? And this is both of the speakers and then we can wrap the session. Dr. I want to go quick. Yeah, uh, in a hyperlax, I think uh, we will have to uh, consider all other things also. Just performing one or two uh, surgical procedures in these uh, cases might not work because I think we'll have to, in addition to addressing the position of the joint itself, we'll also have to address the ligaments per se. And if uh, they are causing any pain or not. I think uh, uh, very often these hyperlax uh, individuals are so very flexible that they might not uh, complain of pain at all. I think in those instances, offering a surgical procedure, I think is not very well justified. I concur with it's Dr. Ajay. I think yeah, yeah, it's it's then uh, obviously I wouldn't touch the patient because uh, your surgery is going to fail. The soft tissue procedure we mentioned, the bony and the soft tissue, the soft tissue is going to fail. The bony procedure may work to shift the, so if you're doing bony, like a heel osteotomy, it's definitely going to work, right? So uh, I would probably do the calc osteotomy, but uh, I think it's, it's brave to uh, expect uh, the soft tissue to heal correctly. 